All right, I want to try out something new, and yeah, this is a new type of video. Hopefully, you guys enjoy it. So today we're gonna to be talking about a uh, Rust shell code injection, or just shell code injection, but I'm gonna be doing it in Rust. So what is shell code injection? So I guess before we answer anything, is like we have to ask ourselves what is shell code. So you can think of shell code as small pieces of executable code that could be used as a payload. The name comes from the fact that when you run shell code, it'll usually run a uh, you'll usually get a command shell, which allows an attacker or just anyone in general, a red team or penetration tester to control or compromise someone's system or machine. That's basically what shell code is. And this example, this is just a you you're running like a this is a C, a C, uh, yeah, a C, uh, C code that it, once you run it, you just initialize a shell. You run a shell. That's basically it for this program. So we go on the next slide. And then if we were to decompile it or like put in a decompiler or disassembler, yeah, disassembler, uh, if you notice right here, uh, you'll get assembly code. But if you notice these, this, uh, this, uh, hi this, uh, I guess letters and word, yeah, these numbers and letters are just, uh, that are highlighted in red is what makes up the shell code. So how your shell code will usually look like will be something like this. It looks something like this, but even though, um, this is kind of correct in the most part, the only problem is that with shell code, you're not allowed to have zeros so this you wouldn't include you'll need to find a way to replace this but in our case we're not going to be building our shell code we're going to be using a specific tool but i'll explain that later so what is shell code injection so now we know what shell code is now what do you what do i mean by shell code injection so also known as portable execu executable injection it's a technique that focusing focuses on writing malicious code in our case malicious shellcode into a virtual address space of another process so techniques in which a red teamer or a hacker can inject code into another process on a machine and usually what they will use is uh, the windows api and these are the three main functions they use virtually allocate write process memory and create remote threat thread so i guess after saying all of that you have to inject it into our process. What does that mean? So what's a process? So in our case, a process is a program that's running on your computer. So an example will be the calculator app, the notepad, or Edge, Microsoft Edge. I don't know who uses that, but yeah, that's basically what it is. And then we ask, we have to ask ourselves, what's virtual address space? So it's basically a range of memory that a program could use. So every process, in our case, every app that's executing on the computer has its own virtual address space which is isolated from the address space of other processes and what we're going to do is inject our shellcode into that address space so why would they why would an attacker do this for the most part so these are the three main things i found was for stealth and evasion when you're running shellcode or malicious code into a trusted process so in our example like i was saying before a calculator it could uh, it could help an attacker avoid suspicion, so it could help them avoid like uh, EDR or antiviruses. Another example would be privilege escalation. So, if the hacker attacks a certain process that has a higher privilege than what they're uh, than what the than what they're currently on, injecting sh most of the time shellcode or code into that process can give you the same level of access as the process that was uh that as as the process that you injected it with so i guess an example would be let's say the calculator hat application had like administrative uh privilege and while as a hacker you only have uh the basic user privilege so you don't have root privileges but if you're able to inject your code inside the calculator app maybe for the most part, you're able to get the calculator apps admin privileges, and from there, you're able to have admin privileges. And another way is persistent. So, if you inject code into like a system or a application, and I'll keep using a calculator app, it allows an attacker to make control even if the entry point was removed or detected. So, an attacker would use this in case, like, let's say if they found a certain way to get in, 
just so they can keep coming back inside the system, they can inject their code into a known process. In my example, I was saying a calculator app. If they're able to inject their process inside a, a, a commonly used app, which is the calculator, and if the entry point, like how they got in, was patched, and if the person keeps on using that commonly used application, like the calculator app, the, uh, the attacker always will find a way to get in because they put a form of persistence able to get in. So for this example, I'm going to be using uh, four functions for the most part, or five, I think. Uh, the four functions are going to be open process. So this helps us get gets the handle of a remote process. This helps us get pick a process in the system that's currently running. We'll get virtual alloc x, which for the most part uh, gives us, uh, it'll have the ability to grant permission to write, uh, it'll give us permission to use that process. Then we'll have the write process memory, which writes our data into that specific process and then create a remote thread or both for the most part start a thread or execute uh our shell code and i think that's about it so i guess i'll show you guys the example that we have made so in my case i was doing it i used rust for the most part so with rust there's a there's a, a library that you can use to interact with the windows api so for the most part when you write uh, a shell code you want to use the Windows API. So in my case, I use the uh, cargo, tomo, uh, uh, cargo cat, back cat, cargo lock. Nope. Uh, so in my case, all I did was, be, oh, this is uh, addition to, all that I did is a while ago. <laughs> so anyway, in my case, what I did, I used the Win32, so uh, Win Sys, Windows Sys, which is a wrapper to, uh, so it's a way uh, Rust is able to communicate with the Windows API. And this is like one of the official ones that I guess Windows is maintaining for the most part. So this should be the most up-to-date one. There's a bunch of other ones like online, but this is the one I currently use. So let me open up a document. So I have this. Win Sys, so it's a, uh, it's Rust for Windows. Uh, it allows us anyone to call the Windows API, as you can see right here. So this is the one I use basically when I'm in my cargo project, my Rust project. So now if we check the source code, uh, back cat main that RS. So right here we have our shell code. I'll tell you how I generate the shell code in a bit, but this is our shell code. So if we keep going down. You see, we have a main function. So in our main, I have please enter a number. So this allows, like in a real world scenario, we wouldn't, this is just like a very simplified example, but in a real world scenario, I don't think we will have like, please enter a number or enter like a specific uh, process number. it will probably find a way to automatically find a process that's currently open. But anyway, let's get started. So right here, what we do is we'll enter the process ID number. And I'll explain later how we'll get the process ID number. After that, we read it in, we turn it into a number. And then after that, we pass it in open process. What open process is going to do is going to, we're going to have access to the, to the, I guess, uh, the objects inside the process. And then all we need to do is basically just pass in the number. Uh, zero and one, that's basically for, uh, I guess, true and false and process all access. This gives us all access to the process. And then from right here, we have virtual alloc X. So I guess the things you have to, I guess, known for it, I guess this is for the most part is regular. Uh, the 460 is just our shell code size. So if we go back up, we see that our shell code size is a uh, 460. So that's where I got 460 from. And then we have mem commit. So what does mem commit do? What does that do? It will commit the changes to the memory, so it will it will change the it will add it will give us the ability to add to give us permissions to add that part to the memory. Now, what does mem reserve? Mem will reserve the space required, so it will like allocate space for us inside inside the I guess the process. It will it will tell us oh we need four hundred sixty uh, space, and then uh, the process will know that we need that amount of space. Now, what does uh, page execute read write it just basically enables read write and execute permissions on the certain region of memory that we're using that's basically it 
and now we have write process memory this basically allows us to write whatever that we would write our shell code inside the process memory basically what it's saying right here and all we need to pass in is h which is the open process the address which is the virtual allocate i guess the permissions and then uh the 460 which is the size and then n which is just uh i guess uh for certain permissions and then we have create remote thread this allows us to execute our current process and then we pass in uh, these certain values to it and if you guys want to look more ahead of what these values do you can just simply like copy this create remote thread and look up the windows api for the most part so windows api create remote thread this function uh, creates a new thread to begin executing uh, that, that runs on virtual address space of another process so these are the things you need to pass in h process attributes dw stack start address parameters creation and thread id and this gives us like an idea of what to put in you might need to read the windows api for the most part so anyway if you go back right here this is basically it for our code and i guess you're asking yourselves how did i create a shell code so for that shell code for the most part all you need to do is basically I have it right here I'm just copying it it's basically pass in you're gonna have, uh, use MSF Venom so what's MSF Venom we could look it up right away but it's basically a tool to create shell code in a uh, Kali if so I guess if you have Kali MSF Venom is a combination of payload generation for encoding and and, and of generation of and encoding so what is it used for generate custom payloads so in our case we're creating a shell code payload and what do we want to do so we want to name the platform we're using in my case we're going to be using windows the architecture type which is x64 uh the payload that we're going to use this is the one you have to pay attention to in my case i use shell reverse tcp why shell reverse TCP? The reason I use this is so I can just simply open up a netcat port to connect to. Now the format is Rust. Why Rust? Because I'm writing it in Rust code. So if you were writing it for a Python code, you'll change it to Python, C++, C, to whatever code you wanted to. Lhost. So what's Lhost? Lhost would simply be the the IP address of your uh, of your machine in my case i'm using the ip address of my machine and l port will be the court that you'll be opening up so you could get the connection back to that's basically it and how do you get the l host simply type if uh ip config or if config depending i always forget which one's which but yeah basically that and then uh what else what else what else uh, i'll check my notes oh and i guess how do i compile this for the most part how do i compile this code so to simply compile it I'm pretty sure there's an easier way to do this, but the way that I did it for the most part was just simply uh, using this. Uh, let's see, I have it right here. Cargo build, and then I named the target, which is x8664. So if I just simply run this, it finished building for the most part. And I already have it built. It's already built on my end. So if I go back right here, go back right here, and then just open CMD. Uh, CD desktop and then hello dot exe I think yeah that's what, that's what I call it hello and it's asking us please enter a number so this number will basically be our process ID so the process that I'm gonna be using is gonna be called notepad and I think I already have notepad open already so this, this is the notepad I'm gonna be using where I have my like little notes and stuff so let's see. I want to see if it comes out in process ID. Uh, notes doesn't come out. That's crazy. Uh, what if I just uh, process hacker? So this is a tool I use. You could probably use something else. And I just type in notes. Notepad. So right here, we get our process ID right here, located right here. Process ID. And in my case, the process ID I'm gonna put is gonna be two four eight two eight. That's for my case. It might be different for you. So I'll go back to right here and then I'll press two, four, eight, two, eight. And before I press that, I want to open up a port on my end because we want to be able to connect to it. And then the port I had it to was 
uh, one, two, three, four. So simply I just type NC NL VP one, two, three, four. And now it's listening on one, two, three, four. So now my Kali machine is, it's looking for a connection back for the most part. So now if we go back right here and if I press enter, we should get a connection. So I press enter. And then if I go back to my Kali machine, we see that I got a reverse reverse shell. So now basically if you actually think about it, if an, if someone was able to execute this for the most part, we're able to get a reverse shell back. And right now I have a, if I type there, we see all the files inside this uh, system clear. Oh, wait, uh, CD desktop. And then uh, we'll probably type hello. Uh, it doesn't do autofill, but anyway, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically like what I want to show you guys. And I guess I want to show you guys, I guess how the connection is made. So if we go back right here and check process hacker and we see the network, click on the network tab, we can see that there's a local address that's connecting to it. And right here, it says the protocol is using TCP and the remote address it's connecting to. So these are the two addresses it's connecting back to, which is pretty insane for the most part. So this is a cool technique that red teamers use. And this is like a super simplified version of it. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure like if, and oh, I guess one thing to keep in mind is that for this to work on your system, you need to have antivirus turned off because uh, if you don't, uh, the antivirus will be able to get it. So there's more advanced techniques that you could use to like obfuscate your code so antivirus won't be able to detect it. But this is the technique that I, well, like I, I just turned it off antivirus just to show you guys this example, but there's more to it. And yeah, so like Defender, if I go on the Microsoft Windows Defender, we see that I have it, uh, I have it off. And you see right here, like when I was testing it out, I just had it on and then like, see, like it, it got caught by uh, by the antivirus. But there is ways that you could, that you could write the code so it won't get, uh, so it won't get caught by antivirus. But this this is just an example of, to show off shell code injection and, and Rust. Uh, I'll be posting my code down below or like on my GitHub so you guys could check it out. But anyway, that's about it for me. And uh, peace.